Hello, I'm Jackie. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. I make writing and reading videos every Monday, and today we're doing something a little different. So after my review of the novel Ship It, I asked some of my friends if they had any other bad books to recommend me, and one of them said that they had gotten a book for free on their college campus, Arms of the Sea by Richard Shapiro. While we were texting, she sent me this article from Lit Review talking about one of his other books, and first book actually, Wild Animus. Apparently it's in every thrift store ever. One person says that they've been to 8,000 different thrift stores, and this book is somehow in every single one of them. In fact, in doing research for this article, the author came across across an estimation from a librarian in 2009 that Wild Animus is the number one audiobook held by libraries, beating out every single Harry Potter book. So at this point I was very intrigued, so I went online and found an interview with Rich Shapiro in Forbes where he talks about how he intends to spend half a million dollars on advertising his book, which at that point he had given away about 50,000 copies. The author of the blog post seems to have found this article because they use it as the benchmark of trying to figure out how much 50,000 copies of a book would cost to print because apparently these books were really nice, well-designed hardcovers, and the cost seems to clock in at around a quarter of a million dollars for just 50,000 copies. And considering the sheer number of copies of this book that are in thrift stores, the author of the blog post estimates that there are 5 million copies of this book in existence. That's 25 million dollars on printing costs alone. In 2010, Yale at the University called a bomb squad about an unattended package in one of their areas, and when the little bomb robot actually was able to crawl up and open the package, it was just more copies of Wild Animus. At this point I was very curious, so I returned to YouTube, and there is only one YouTube video about this whole phenomenon made by film students at the University of Brighton in the UK. This guy on Reddit is saying, Wild Animus, a fetid adjective bomb that was handed out for free at several colleges and book fairs, an act I feel to be a form of assault. Right? And so we've got people handing the book out at festivals, at book fairs, so this is a woman dressed as a wolf handing out a paperback copy, you've got <laughs> obviously very clearly very desperate for people to um, take one, please, <laughs> we'll pay you. In Adelaide, Australia in 2007, it was reported that wolf women were harassing male passers-by. Uh, snarling and clawing and dancing in the streets, and I didn't actually believe it until I saw the footage for myself. In Chicago, Barcelona, London, Paris, these demonstrations have been put on. Uh, thousands of copies of the book have been handed out, and it's all being self-funded by the author, the mysterious Rich Shapiro. Hi, is this David? Yes, hello. Hi, David, uh, my name is Henry. I'm calling uh, regarding the marketing strategy you guys did for a book called Wild Animus. I believe you worked with a man named Rich uh, Shapiro. Yeah. Hello, hello. Hi. That's a blast from the past. Oh my God. <laughs> um, yeah, we're basically, uh, we're doing a documentary sort of uh, tracking the marketing strategy and the distribution okay. he sort of employed to advertise the book. Sorry, who are you working for? I knew as soon as he'd asked that question that we weren't going to get any further and as much as I waffled on and on about who we were and sort of what our angle was, uh, I knew it wasn't doing any good. I started to go a little bit insane. Email David. Check up on David. Check LinkedIn again. Have I received any new check emails? emails? Make sure you check your Maybe emails. Maybe we're going about this the wrong way. What haven't way. we done? What haven't we done yet? What am I missing? What are we what missing? Trying to contact check Google. Just, 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 just go back to Google. Why won't anybody talk to us about this book? So yeah, I was definitely going to read this. <laughs> Now, I read the book on my phone using the Too Far Media app, which uh, is beautiful. However, you can only read it if your phone is horizontal. And that's because at certain points in the story, there's like a Doctor Who-like crack that appears. And you can pull it in order to access songs, and then pull it again to access artwork. Now, if the book is bad, the songs are worse. The only thing is the songs are hilarious. <laughs> Limbs dig, planet stiff. Net straining, feeling a weight shift A pressure above my eyes lift Wild Animus begins in 1970 on the Berkeley campus. Now, the author Rich Shapiro did not bother to explain the Berkeley riots, but I did end up looking it up myself because I was pretty confused. 
Not a good start, buddy. So it all started when then-Governor Ronald Reagan got a little annoyed about Berkeley students using a local park to protest, so he closed the park. The students, guess what? Protested it. Should have seen that one coming. The police were called in and things got very, very violent, escalating to the point where one student who was visiting the campus with some friends was killed by police. And then everything was fine. Just kidding, it got worse. The opening chapter of the book has main character Sam walking through a crowd when the tear gas canister is thrown into it and he is blinded. Stumbling through the crowd, he finds a woman, grabs her hand, and together they stumble their way to a bathroom where they wash the tear gas out of their eyes. Now, I don't know if tear gas was different in the 1970s, but after 2020, we all know you can't wash tear gas out with regular water, so... Luckily, the person he grabbed onto the crowd was a hot 19-year-old named Lindy who clutches his face and says, you will be happy, and, uh... Yeah, they fall madly in love. They then go back to the crowd where Sam encounters his friend Josh, who is really into this. He's got the black armband protesting the Vietnam War and everything. They then engage in a discussion about what the point of the protest is. Josh, who is very much into changing the world, making it a better place, and not going to die in the Vietnam War, thinks that this is a great idea. Sam disagrees. It's a carnival, Josh, throwing firecrackers at Daddy. Don't be an elitist. Sam shook his head. There's no higher view. The flower children are making yogurt, the bikers are shooting smack, and the lowbrows are sniffing glue. Fifty years from now, people will look back at us and say, what a bunch of idiots. We're all playing our part. Josh's sigh betrayed his own disheartenment. Sitting in class for four years, soaking up worthless information, we've learned more on LSD. Josh then gets concerned that Sam is doing nothing but sitting in his room doing lots and lots of drugs. Sam thinks this is a great idea because the only time he feels any kind of emotion is when he's very high. Sam then finds Lindy again and, wanting to get her phone number, runs over to a newsstand where he grabs a random magazine, hands her a pen, and she writes her number across it. Looking down, he realizes the magazine is Alaska Sportsman, and she's written her number across a beautiful doll sheep on a mountainside, and he's immediately like, whoa, sheep. In the next couple chapters, we find out that Sam has a rather complicated family situation. His parents are divorced. His mom wanted to be a movie star, but was unable to get any work once she got pregnant. And Sam tells Lindy that his mother actually wouldn't get out of bed or eat food or anything like that unless he was there to more or less force her and was the sole caregiver of his younger sister. Now, considering the fact that Sam says on multiple occasions the only time he feels joy is when he's on drugs, I would think it's safe to assume that he had depression, and based on his description of his mother, I think it's inherited. <laughs> After learning that Sam was originally part of a band but quit because it was getting too commercial, he gets a phone call from his sister saying that his father has cancer but their mother has frozen his bank account so he can't afford his treatment anymore, and his sister is afraid that if she gets a job in order to help him, their mother will steal all of her money. Sam responds to this by hanging up and completely ignoring her. Sam decides to do lots and lots of LSD and contemplate about how he just wants to run away and ignore all of them, but he's just too scared. But after he has drug-induced sex with Lindy, which includes the line, Lindy's breasts were the breasts of fantasy, he no longer feels that fear. So I figured after the drug-induced sex and the release of fear, I'm like, okay, this is why they run away. I would be really pissed if I called my brother for help and he ran away to another state, but you know... I can at least understand the instinct. Uh, no, they stay in California for another four months, completely ignoring his sister, blocks her calls, he actually unplugs his phone so she can't reach him. <laughs> no, what actually motivates them to leave is Sam's LSD dealer getting busted. So yeah, after Sam realizes that he's out of drugs, he and Cindy drive to Seattle where they proceed to take LSD and climb a mountain, which is a bad idea, don't do that. Like, some of the reviews on Goodreads were like, you will die if you, take, if you climb this mountain high. And this is where Sam decides to change his name to Ransom, because he's gonna be in pursuit of a spiritual higher truth. The novel then time jumps into the future, where Sam has decided to pursue his spiritualness by dressing up as a doll sheep. He literally starts rock climbing with, like, hooves and just wears these skins. At a later point in the story, he goes to an antique shop and buys ram's horns where he, like, molds it into a headdress and runs around in it. It's, it's so weird. It's really weird. At this point, Lindy is working as a waitress and he doesn't have a job. His job is running around in a sheep costume. At one point, she confronts him about this, leading to the absolutely hilarious line of, I can't pump gas and be a shaman in my spare time. It's a reoccurring theme in this book that Lindy calls out Sam slash Ransom on his BS, and Sam slash Ransom responds with, it's fine, okay, yeah, I'll get a job, I'll just abandon all of this stuff I've spent so long on, and I'll just get a job and give you children. And then she's like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, you go do your thing, yeah, I don't care if you do LSD 24-7, it's cool, it's great. 
And then Lindy feels utterly ashamed for ever asking him to give this up. At one point in the story, she even compares her trepidations about this to her abusive aunt still being inside her and controlling her. Okay, if you don't have issues with your man walking around in a sheep costume and taking all of your earnings to buy drugs, I think there's a problem with you. After a while, Lindy is able to take a week off work and they go up to Alaska on her dime, obviously. And Sam slash Ransom is finally able to encounter doll sheep in the flesh, to which he says they are sexual beings and he and Lindy have sex among all the sheep. Don't do that. Please don't do that. You're gonna get killed by a wild animal. Oh my god, do not have sex around wild animals. Anyway, Sam slash Ransom, I'm just gonna call him Ransom at this point on because that's what he called for the rest of the story. Uh, Ransom decides that Lindy is possessed by the spirit of the wolf and he needs to like kill the wolf spirit in order to make her not horny. I don't know. This book was really confusing. Um, but anyway, at another point he goes back to Alaska without Lindy in order to study wolves. I don't know who let this guy near wolves, but he spends some time with some researchers. Uh, he gets one person to leave him alone on Mount Wrangell because he figures out it's volcanic. And at this point, he's been searching for the molten heart of the earth for a while. He doesn't do a good job explaining the molten heart of the earth theory until later in the book, but I will read his explanation of that. Our colder parts, hair and teeth and bones, they huddle around the heart like a hearth, Ransom said. We are teeth and bones in the world we live in. We are dollops and embers cast off and cooling. We come from the headwaters of the molten earth. A glowing god set us loose in the world, wrapped in a husk like a piece of himself. The longer we're gone from him, the colder and harder we grow. That's our sin, our shame. To feel the iron chill closing over us, remembering how our hearts once glowed. So yeah, he spends the entire book trying to find a volcano because he's convinced that, you know, that's going to make him happy. I honestly think he should just go on some antidepressants, but to each their own. <laughs> so anyway, he convinces someone to drop him off at Mount Wrangell in the middle of the wilderness, and the first thing he does is do some more LSD, because I don't think he's sober for more than 10 minutes in this story, and puts on a full sheep costume complete with the horns and starts wandering around. <laughs> Now, because Mount Wrangell is just straight up wilderness, a pack of wolves start noticing a guy running around in a sheep costume with horns and goes, ah, dinner. Ransom then has to stand up and be like, not sheep, not sheep, don't eat me, please don't eat me. <laughs> he then has to run away from the wolves, sobers up, thinks, okay, maybe there weren't ever actually wolves, maybe I just hallucinated them, which is a high possibility at this point, yeah, and swears off LSD. He then does LSD again three pages later. <laughs> So once again under the influence of LSD, he encounters the wolves, this time they actually manage to bite him in the chest, and he has to stumble his way back to civilization. Does he learn anything from his experience? No. No, he doesn't. Ransom is now completely convinced that when the sheep attacked him, he wasn't just dressed fully like a sheep and smelled like a sheep and looked like a sheep, he actually was a sheep, transformed by the god Animus. Now crazier than ever, he goes back to Seattle to live with Lindy, who is still working double shifts as a waitress to finance all of his crazy adventures. At one point, Lindy asks him to stop doing LSD every 10 seconds, and he tries to burn his manuscript in an effort to remember who he is and how he's going to be a good husband who actually has a job, and then she cries and begs for forgiveness and gives him more LSD. Under the influence of the drug, Ransom strips naked and runs around the neighborhoods of Seattle screaming. Unsurprisingly, the police are called, they realize this guy is a raving lunatic, and they drop him off the psych ward of the hospital. Good. Finally, at this point I'm like, okay, someone's finally gonna get this guy some actual mental health care. But apparently even the 1970s, they're like, budget cuts! Off you go with your wife! By the way, that wolf bite he got a while ago, he's repeatedly reopening it with a knife in order to offer blood to Animus. The next morning, as Lindy's getting ready for work, Ransom tells her, don't even bother going in, I called your boss and I quit for you, we're moving to Alaska. And for some reason, Lindy is totally fine with this. At this point in the story, Ransom starts telling Lindy how he needs to sacrifice himself to Animus and fear is the only thing holding him back and he needs to be one with a volcano and it... It gets really concerning, like... At this point, Ransom decides that he needs to climb Mount Wrangell in order to go to the volcano summit and just commune with Animus in his sheep costume. He actually gets a team, and when the team finds out that this is the reason why they're climbing a mountain, they are uh, less than enthused. <laughs> now thinking that everybody thinks he's crazy, wow, what a wild assumption to make, uh, Ransom decides to ditch the group and start climbing the summit himself, which is a terrible idea. Throughout the book, there are sections where Ransom is transformed into the doll sheep, which is written in italics and bolded. I skimmed a lot of that because it was really boring. He's convinced he's the sheep at this point, but as he's trying to climb the mountain on his own, there's someone watching him with binoculars, and he's still just a guy in a sheep costume. Like, there's nothing supernatural going on throughout the 
story, just a guy on LSD wandering around in a sheep costume going, BAH! I'm a sheep! <laughs> Apparently Animus tells him climbing the mountain on his own is a bad idea, so he climbs back down, rejoins the group, and they go back down. Uh, if you think this is the end of his obsession with getting up Mount Wrangell, you are wrong. By the way, this entire time he's working on a book called Wild Animus because he's decided that the spirits of all animals are an animus spirit, and that is the god of all things, and it lives in volcanoes. After finishing his book, Ransom decides that Lindy needs to come up with him on Mount Wrangell, I don't know why, but the guy who's flying them to the mountain looks at his wife and goes, uh, yeah, you can't bring a woman who doesn't know how to hike on a dangerous mountain. Like, that's a really bad idea. And Lindy's course is utterly devoted to him for absolutely no reason. It just sounds so abusive at this point. Um, but yeah, the guy uh, says, I am not dropping your wife off, she's coming with me. So Ransom pulls out a knife and threatens him into leaving Lindy with him. So while on Mount Wrangell, they almost die in a snowstorm, Lindy finally finally realizes that Ransom's insane, <laughs> and conveniently right at this same time, Ransom decides that he doesn't give a damn about human love anymore, and he's going to commit himself fully to Animus. So they get back, Lindy decides she's done, she's not gonna do this anymore, and Sam climbs back up Mount Wrangell, where he dies in a lava flow torn apart by wolves. So at this point, some of you are probably thinking, mysterious millionaire self-funds a project that turns out to be terrible? That sounds familiar. The Room is a 2003 written, directed, produced, financed, and starred in by Tommy Wiseau. Now beloved by drunk liberal art students everywhere, The Room is fondly considered to be the best worst movie ever made. It originally ran for only two weeks in one California movie theater, but in that time a film critic noticed how hilarious it was and started inviting all of his friends to see it with him almost every night. It was during this time that many of The Room's traditions, such as throwing spoons on the screen when the inexplicable pictures of framed spoons appear, <laughs> or throwing a football around in the bizarre amount of football scenes in the movie, were born. With the bizarre dialogue... How much is it? It'll be $18. Oh, keep the change. <laughs> I don't. The plot lines that go absolutely nowhere. I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. And the bizarre recasting of a main character halfway through the movie without anybody acknowledging it. What's going on here? The Room is an absolute smorgasbord of weirdness. One person described The Room as a movie made by an alien who has never seen a movie before, but it's had them thoroughly explained to him. No one knows where Tommy Wiseau is from, although his accent strongly points towards somewhere in Eastern Europe, how old he is, or how he made his money. The making of this movie has been subjected to so much wild speculation that it inspired the 2017 movie The Disaster Artist starring the Franco Brothers. Scene 112, take 13, mark it. Action. I did not hit her. I. Okay, okay, wine. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Now, like Tommy Wiseau, Rich Shapiro is an intensely private person who doesn't seem to like any kind of suggestions about how he made his money or how much he spent on his project, and he doesn't like to give interviews at all. Uh, multiple blog posts have talked about how it's just impossible to find interviews with this guy, and the one that was referenced in the Lit Review article might have been fabricated, which is why I didn't reference it in this video. But unlike Tommy Wiseau, who is from Eastern Europe and probably made his money there, and, you know, American reporters will probably never be able to track it down because we're not even sure what country he's from, Rich Shapiro is an American from California, and I happen to know that you cannot make money in the United States without leaving some kind of a paper trail. And I was gonna find it. <laughs> so my first stop was Richard Shapiro's website, which is completely unhelpful because it's as ranty and ravey as the book he wrote. The About Me section features passages like this. The truth is, I don't feel a deep connection through my genetic lineage, nor do I feel much of a cultural genealogy. I have an ancestor who goes back five generations in America, and I like living in California, but what really nourishes me is the love I share with my immediate family and my sense of community as a tribe of artistic heroes who've staked their claim on the unseen world. Where are you from? So he also has a contact me page and I sent him an email that was not full of lies, but I definitely twisted some things to make it sound like I liked the book more than I did and I have yet to receive a response. So with that avenue exhausted, I moved on to genealogical records. 
Since U.S. Census records are sealed for 72 years and Richard Shapiro was born in 1948, I figured his birth records would be unsealed and I would be able to get access to his parents' names and look them up to see if this is a small loan of a million dollars situation or if he's a self-made man. I was able to find his birth record in the California Index of Births. However, he has no parents listed outside the name Pollock. After some research, it turns out Pollock is a Jewish surname, which makes sense because Shapiro is also Hebrew, so he's probably got some Jewish ancestry going on here. But honestly, I prefer to think that this man was born from a fish. After exhausting that area of inquiry, I moved on to his business ventures. Now, Rich Shapiro is not an easy man to find, trust me. I blocked out a full eight hours of my day trying to figure out what happened in this man's life, and I have a lot of gaps that need to get filled in, but quite frankly, I, I can't spend an entire year doing this. So Rich Shapiro has a profile in Bloomberg where he's listed as the director or CEO or of some kind on all of these organizations. Crosspoint Ventures, Shiva Corporation, Sun Microsystems, Infometrics General Corporation, ATS Corporation, Univac, Tops, New Edge Networks, Covad Communication, and iBeam. There is also a profile on Topio Network where he's listed as the founder of three companies, the CEO of Shiva Corp, VP of Sun Microsystems Incorporated, the president of Top, senior director of marketing at ATS Research, marketing slash sales for Infometrics General Corporation, Univac, Sagent, director of Digital Island slash Diamond Lane slash Netboost slash Fable slash Object Switch slash Jetstream Communications slash Cabrio Technology slash iBeam Broadcasting slash Covad Communications slash Blue Star Communications slash Web.com group slash powerwave technologies slash aristosoft what <laughs> so at this point i had to look into how venture capitalism works <laughs> so basically if you have an idea for a company but you've never started a company before a bank is probably not going to give you a loan because they have no reason to believe that you have any kind of abilities whatsoever your only choice is to go to a venture capitalist group where rich people essentially give their money to people and say invest in things and make me more money the venture capitalists then hear pitches from various entrepreneurs who want to get funded, give them money, and it's at a very high interest rate because a bank won't touch you. What other choice do you got? So the idea is that someone from the venture capitalist firm will then go on to be part of your board of directors kind of as a babysitter for the money, make sure that you're not spending it wildly and can kind of spy on you to see what's happening. And that's what Rich Shapiro did. That's how he ended up on the board of directors of all of these companies. Now in the United States, when a company is going to be publicly traded on the stock market, they have to file something called an investment prospectus with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is basically a super detailed document talking about everything going on with your company so that way investors can make an informed decision on whether or not you're a good investment. And one of the things you have to list in that document is how you're paying your board of directors and how much they're making. So out of all the corporations that I mentioned, only a couple of them ever went public. Covad Communications, iBeam, Sun Microsystems, PowerWave Technologies, Shiva Corporation, and Blue Star Communications. Now, there's no information on Blue Star Communications because even though Rich Shapiro was part of their board, they are a Canadian company, and I didn't even want to bother trying to learn another country's stock exchange practices. And Sun Microsystems, I can find no evidence that Rich Shapiro was ever affiliated with them. But Covad Communications, iBeam, PowerWave, and Shiva Corporation, I was able to find data for. And I also found his name on a prospectus for Maxim Pharmaceuticals for some reason, which is never mentioned anywhere else, but it's definitely him. There's only one Rich Shapiro, it's not that common a name. Now for all these corporations, they do list in their documents that they don't pay their board of directors money. They're paying them in stock in the company, which is considered best practices for a lot of businesses. Basically, if you do a really good job, the value of the stock goes up, and if you do a terrible job, the value of the stock goes down. That way, your money is actually tied to your performance and how well you run the company. However, there's definitely some money changing hands because the PowerWave Technologies Prospectus lists how Rich Shapiro and one other guy were the only ones to not waive their fee for meeting for the board of directors, which was $1,500 per meeting, and they met seven times. I'm starting to think I should go into venture capitalism. So for Covad Communications, Rich Shapiro was paid paid 2,647,519 shares, which is 1.5% of the entire company. Now, based on the information I can find, NASDAQ says that this was trading for $18 a share, which equals $47,655,342. That's $47 million just in Covad Communications. And this guy is on so many boards of directors. For his role in the role of iBean, he was paid 15,144,498 shares, or 16% of the company. And at $10 a share, that basically means at a zero, 
for iBeam. For PowerWave Technologies, she was given 759,578 shares, or 4.7% of the company, and considering the fact this company was delisted when they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2013, I honestly can't figure out how much money that would be. Now with Blue Star Communications, I couldn't really find any data for the stock market because they were Canadian and all that, but there was a very interesting thing that I found in some news articles. Essentially, at one point, Kovat Communications bought Blue Star Communications, and one of the partners for Covad was essentially suing the board of directors saying that they only bought Blue, Co Blue Star because it was a failing company and Crosspoint Ventures had actually invested heavily in it and they really just wanted to save their investment. It was not in the best interest of the company to buy Blue Star. And specifically listed in the court case is saying that the board of directors had a uh, conflict of interest because they were heavily involved in both, especially Rich Shapiro who owned a whopping 46% of Blue Star stock. 46%! This guy owned almost half the company and he was on the board of directors for Kovad and was one of the people that voted for them to acquire Blue Star so they could make money off of it. So my question at this point was how the frick does an LSD using BA in English literature end up being a venture capitalist? And I think I might have found the answer. There was a hint in that Tobio Networks biography saying that he had founded three successful companies. And when I was looking at an article in SFGate, he's listed as a former successful entrepreneur. Uh, that same article talks about how one of his co-workers was a philosophy major and how Crosspoint Ventures kind of likes, you know, people who are a bit kooky and have unusual backgrounds. So my guess is that Rich Shafiro founded some companies in the 70s and 80s, probably affiliated with computers because that was the hot thing at the time, and also all of his work later on was affiliated with computers in some way. Uh, so probably Crosspoint Ventures needed someone to explain these newfangled doohickeys to them and had a soft point for weird creative types. At this point, we don't know how much money Rich Shapiro has, but Crosspoint Venture charges a 3% fee for all of their services, and their funds are a billion dollars. That's $30 million a year just for the firm, and they don't have that many employees. This guy has millions and millions. So yeah, he can spend $25 million self-publishing a book, and it's a drop of nothing to him. Can you imagine having that much money? that $25 million for self-publishing is nothing. And you write wild animus. So this brings me to my final point. Why is the self-funded venture of the Rome celebrated while the self-funded venture of wild animus is so widely hated by everyone? Have you read the Goodreads reviews on these things? They are brutal. And I think the conclusion I came to is that the room is fun. <laughs> Honestly, the closest thing I can think to compare it with after rewatching it is Twilight. And by that I mean it's a love triangle where nothing happens for 90% of the film and then it escalates very quickly. Watching bad movies is also fundamentally a social art. If you've seen The Room, think about the context in which you saw it. You probably were in a room full of friends who were all drunk on scotchka, which is the, uh, the drink in the movie where they take half a glass of whiskey and then they just pour half a glass of vodka on top of it because, yeah, that'll mess you up. <laughs> The reason The Room got so popular in the first place is because when they realized that audience thought the movie was hilarious, uh, Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero started doing midnight showings, encouraging audience participation and doing Q&As afterwards. They essentially realized their audience was drunk college kids and they went with it. <laughs> Reading a book is primarily a solitary experience. You can't turn to your friend and go, this is weird, right? Also, Tommy Wiseau wrote a very boring fantasy in a way. The character's main thing is that he has a girlfriend that he buys dresses and roses for. All the retail workers he encounters absolutely love him and say that they're his favorite customer and he has a best friend. I mean, that's just wholesome. Rich Shapiro's fantasy is dressing up in a goat costume, abusing his wife, and dying on a mountain. Also, not to mention, this book glorifies self-harm and suicide. And at Lana, I was reading this, the only thing I could think is, you handed this out on college campuses. Based on the data I can find, 10% of the people that this book was handed to were actively considering suicide, and you gave them a book saying that it was the bravest and most self-sacrificing thing you can do is commit suicide. F you.
And all I can think is, why does this guy want people to read his book so badly? This goes beyond hubris. This is like religious zealotism. People point out that the only other book you're ever handed for free on a college campus, or really anywhere, is the Bible. This guy seems to think of himself as some kind of Christ trying to save the world with a story of a guy who dies in a volcano dressed in a sheep costume. So the fundamental difference between The Room and Wild Animus is that Tommy Wiseau is the guy at a bar who's drunk and he bring him over the table and he starts spouting wild stories and it's weird but everyone's having a good time. Rich Shapiro is the guy on a street corner who follows you screaming about how you need to submit to the wild god Animus while you clutch your pepper spray and hope he goes away. So in conclusion, watch The Room. Don't read any of Rich Shapiro's book. Do not download the app. However, maybe look on YouTube and look up his hilarious, really bad music. If you like this video, go ahead and like it. If you got something to add or just find this utterly weird, go ahead and leave a comment. I make writing and reading videos every Monday, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Rock back on my belly, smoke swirling.